The year is 1974, and New York City is a cesspool. Vice and crime run rampant in the streets of the once vibrant metropolis. Political corruption is on the rise, and the city teeters on the verge of bankruptcy. But two tough-as-nails cops are about to take it all back. Well, that's the story anyway. The Super Cops is the tale of Dave Greenberg and Bob Hans. The two men were probationary patrol officers eager to clean up the mean streets of the Big Apple, and they weren't about to let a little thing like not actually being cops yet stand in their way. In their off-duty hours, they cruised the worst precinct of the city looking for drug dealers, petty criminals, and other assorted lowlifes to bust. In just four years on the force, the duo had made over 600 arrests, earning them the nicknames Batman and Robin, and enough notoriety to land book and film deals. The Super Cops by L.H. Whitmore was a dramatization of the duo's story, following the men through their days in the police academy and their nights on the sordid streets of Alphabet City. The book became a bestseller and was the basis for a movie, also called The Super Cops, released in 1974. That same year, Red Circle, an imprint of Archie Comics, released a Super Cops comic, although it wasn't adapted from either the book or the movie, but instead comprised of four new short stories, all written by Marv Channing. In Crime is Out of Fashion, Bob and Dave are on patrol in New York's legendary garment district, which apparently is a hotbed of thieves, muggers, and pickpockets. We're told early that the super cops use unconventional methods to collar their criminals, and we don't have to wait long for an example. A wacky plan is hatched in which Bob will hide in a rack of coats and literally grab criminals as they run by. And while it might sound stupid to you and I, these are 1970s era police cops with the matching mustaches to prove it. You don't have to like it, pal. They get results. Emboldened, our heroes envision a new scheme to entrap a gang of thieves. This time, Dave will hide. In a crate. <laughs> yeah, sure, mister. We'll put you in a crate. Now, I didn't go to the academy or anything, but these unconventional methods have less to do with our super cops being clever and more to do with the criminals being rock stupid. They left the truck door open. In these stories, catching criminals is akin to leaving the porch light on for moths. You have to wonder what the big damn deal about these two particular cops is supposed to be. I mean, other than the way their superiors look in the opposite direction every time they pull this bullshit. That said, these guys are too much. In our second story, Bedlam Beat, Bob and Doug get called on their nonsense and are busted down to desk duty. Being the lovable morons that they are, it isn't long before they screw everything up and are called into the chief's office. The two have some big ideas about how their talents can best be utilized, but the chief has something else in mind, making the new rookies traffic cops outside of the station. Still, it isn't long before these two find a way to make even that into a fascist totalitarian nightmare. Pulling cars over that jump a slow light, our dynamic duo have soon ticketed dozens of drivers, essentially strong-arming their own boss and putting them on a beat, and leading to a small-scale riot outside of the police station. I don't know about you, but I'm starting to get a bad feeling about these two. One that can only be assuaged with an official super cop's watch. Twelve ninety-five. dollars That's a lot of money for 1974. Hell, that's a lot of money for now. Still, you do get some monographs. You'll want to frame those, kids. In our third torrid tale, next stop at the cemetery, Bob and Dave are taken off of the beat and made into plain clothesmen. The pair hatch a plan to surprise Junkie Joyce in her rented apartment. Dave, or is it Bob, comes on all heavy-like, kicking in her door and costing her a security deposit. With their game of good cop, bad cop, the two intimidate this most fetching of junkies into rolling over on her connection. Though in all fairness, she probably just wants them out of the apartment before they break anything else. Joyce meets up with her connection at midnight, but the creep tumbles our hero's game and sends Dave to his death 
on the subway's electrified third rail. Bob catches the creep, but laments the loss of his partner. After all, where's he going to find another guy who looks that much like him? Dave, however, is too much to die, and he goes on to play it to a bust another day. Two to Get Ready and Four to Go rounds out this issue with some notable Frank Robbins artwork. Bob and Dave don't want to go home without making a bust, so they orchestrate an illegal street race. Apparently the concept of entrapment hasn't been invented yet, so they have a patsy set it up and then they sit back to watch the mayhem. It's only in the last story that we get a sense of what this book might have been, with Frank Robbins delivering some frenetic and funky panel work. Sheesh, we could have used more barump in the first 20 pages. With their cars trashed, the racers attack the cops before turning tail. The action continues with a foot chase, which is the closest this book comes to delivering on that Batman promise. Because you got a cape on the laundry line. Bob and Dave manage to corner their quarry and take them down with unconventional methods, leading to this, the most sitcom of all comics endings. Oh, Muldoon, what are we going to do with you? Each of these stories end with Greenberg and Hans grinning as people are led away in chains. Who did Red Circle actually think would relate to these ass clowns? Ignoring departmental procedure and protocol, the two play it to a bust at the expense of civil rights and due process. They are, in short, too much. And I am Jason R. Mink. For the old guys who like old comics network, thanks for watching.